So my talk today is called Foundations of Crypto Economic Systems. It's actually based on um, some research that I've been doing with the Crypto Economics Institute in Vienna, but also more broadly addressing sort of some of the, the philosophical and governance questions that arise, it's a sort of mixture of topics. But I think the main goal here is to sort of motivate the interdisciplinarity of the research and sort of show the sort of relative depth of the different fields that we're touching on. And so I will start off by sort of acknowledging the questions that we are posing in this field and the different fields that we're using to address it. So um, I, I recently finished a paper with Sherman Balshamger, who's the uh, director of the Crypto Economics uh, Research Institute. And um, in our paper, we ask a lot of foundational questions about who gets to make decisions under what circumstances, how does this change over time, and, and generally like understanding the relationship between decision making processes and groups of people. Um, I actually did my, my PhD work on algorithmic allocation of resources um, in networks, uh, multi-agent systems, etc. And what we find is that even when the decisions about how to make resource allocations are done using algorithmic methods, you actually still need to have humans at some level making design decisions about those algorithmic policies, about what the goals of those systems are. And so you end up with a scenario where you have to consider individual decisions, individual decisions with respect to algorithms, like system or institutional level decisions, and that includes the creation or design of algorithms. And even in the case of sort of optimization paradigms, you have to ask what are you optimizing for? And so there's a sort of inherent set of trade-offs that you know can't be eliminated through you know adding computers and by adding automation or administration of processes. So there's a gap between what a process can do for you and what you do inside of the process and even adapt the process. So we want to make sure that we aren't thinking um, purely in um, sort of financial economic maximization terms, but actually thinking about sort of coordinated decision making in a world where there's no one right answer, but that means that who gets to make what decision when matters a lot. So um, a brief sort of aside for clarification. So I get a lot of different questions about the the nature of um, um, of my work and the work with all the communities that, that I do work with. And I think um, the confusion sometimes comes from the fact that there's a lot of overlap in some of these things. So um, in particular, sort of token engineering versus CAD CAD versus common stack often creates a question like, okay, like what, what is that? And so I wanted to sort of clarify it. Um, and, and the clarification is pretty simple, actually. Um, we have Block Science, which I founded, which is an engineering design firm. I'm an engineer. A, a automation, decentralized systems, like decision making, cyber physical systems engineer. And I am ex super excited about crypto bringing these sort of model-based systems engineering techniques into social and economic systems with proper respect for what the governance of a large scale system actually looks like, especially when it's infrastructural and a lot of people depend on it. So part of what grew out of that was um, the sort of CAD CAD methods and tools that we built for ourselves and then open source. And we collaborated with the common stack and the token engineering community to get those materials open sourced. Um, and we continue to leverage them in pretty much all avenues of our work. But as the community has grown around these methods and tools, we've gotten to sort of need more standards, best practices, developing patterns and sort of doing what I consider the, the beginning of an engineering discipline, which is um, something applied inherently. But uh, when you think about patterns and best practices, standards, educations about patterns, best practices and standards, um, that's generally the purview of, of a discipline, not of a specific firm and not of a tool. And it's not about a specific method or a specific pattern. It's about coming together around valuing those best practices, patterns, et cetera, and evolving them and educating. So common stack, on the other hand, is, is applied and specifically to these um, institutional patterns around managing public goods. And um, you know, I'll speak a bit more about bonding curves and I may make some comments about conviction voting. These are patterns that we are exploring, we're testing, we're iterating with communities to learn how to better manage shared resources. But ultimately, uh, the, the product of this is not just 
computational tools, but actually institutional patterns and sort of the the essentially the constitutions or the bylaws and the sort of expectations and norms around those institutions are just as important to the health of that institution as the the sort of computer infrastructure that you get from um, building smart contracts and, and building tools. So to the questions about we and who, the truth is that the institution is the we, and the effort is to build a healthy institution. Hence the research into the sort of best practices and standards and governance and what has been learned through the work of Ostrom and others um, on what is a healthy institution. And actually one of the main thrusts here is to try to make some of those patterns that work at small scales a bit more scalable or potentially to identify ways of sort of incorporating them and building relationships between them so that you get, you know, scalable federations or networks of smaller scale institutions where it's not so dangerous, where the, the, the value controlled by an individual group of decision makers who have been essentially selected through the internal institutional process are not like, you know, controlling an unsafe amount of, uh, of value or they're not, um, essentially in a position to hide or opaquely, you know, seek their own interests at the expense of the institution's interests. And so those are the kind of applied areas and um, the academic research that I've been doing both during my PhD at Penn and during my time as an affiliate with the VAU has been very focused on both philosophical and mathematical fo foundations of this sort of human-centric yet data-driven set of systems. Like we don't want to ignore the importance of data and computation, we just have to put it in proper contrast to the, um, uh, the, the needs, wants, and the sort of differences or heterogeneity in the individuals and actually give them enough freedom to express themselves rather than treat them as irrational as soon as they don't do the thing that we've pre-prescribed was optimal for them. So with that in mind, I'm going to unpack my perspective on crypto economic systems by looking at a couple different fields and their relationship to each other and to, um, to designing and analyzing systems. And in particular here, I'm going to move computer science into the sort of material substrate. It's super important um, in the sense that when you build a bridge, you need to actually be aware of and use material science. For example, there are actually materials used in bridges that have adaptive um, sort of temperature size, they, they, they change size and temperature that helps make bridges resilient to um, fluctuating temperatures in different climates. And in a way, all of the cool stuff that people are building in computer science, from my perspective, is like the material science for engineers. Like we can only do things insofar as we have the, uh, the capabilities to build what we want design, but the actual design is a higher higher level thing. And we're talking about economics and complex systems and systems engineering as sort of um, areas that exist that have literature that we can build on. And in particular, there are already some interdisciplinary fields that make heavy use of computation and data um, related to these things. And computational social science, operations research, and cyber physical systems are the fields that I'm going to talk about briefly today. So um, one last comment on the sort of role of the actual implementations on the computer science and software development at the lowest levels is that this is the technical capability and it, it, it's necessary and important and we're making tons of awesome uh, leaps and gains um, in our communities, building out uh, you know, better layer ones, new layer two tools, et cetera. And that these sort of lowest level protocols, they sort of enforce information provenance. That means they can sort of prove the state of the system or prove the validity of computation in various peer-to-peer uh, -peer network configurations, which may be blockchains, but that also includes content addressable DHTs and other sorts of um, sort of proofs of, of, of validity. I'm a fan of Truebit as a tool for allowing sort of more complex uh, computations to be made cryptographically verifiable. Um, in particular though, all of this, you know, cryptographically verifiable uh, data flow or information flow or state change empowers us to implement um, these interaction patterns, which are essentially 
Um, not yet the agent behavior. The interaction pattern is the, the set of rules or the games that you make available for agents to play. They include what you can do and what will happen if you do it, and their patterns because they, they are not the specific actions. The agents then use the patterns to take actions, which kind of connects into a broader flow of value through a graph, both service and sort of effort, both inside and outside of the system. Um, and I think this is where things kind of get abstract and hard. And some of the interesting research that relates to composing games actually comes from the category theory research. Um, and I've been, you know, sort of blessed to have some conversations with some category theorists who uh, are both very theoretical mathematicians and computer scientists, as well as folks who are actually starting to try to cross apply that literature to cyber physical systems. Um, so if we talk a bit about what economics is, we can think of it actually as applied decision making and the consequences thereof. To be honest with you, if you tried to define it, you would get, you know, more definitions than you would get people trying to define it. Even this paper that I'm going to reference on uh, retrospectives on the definition of economics points out this in, this breadth and the and this sort of semi-consistency of it. So we'll just say broadly, it's the study of coordination processes, the effects of scarcity, the science of choice, human behavior, and essentially um, you know, how and why people behave the way that they do, which means that we're covering not just economics in the um, sort of neoliberal sense, but we're actually talking about this like political economy and the sort of processes of, of customs and norms, et cetera. So in order to do this, though, we are going to focus a bit on the institutional economics paradigm, where we are going to talk about the, the systems as being um, comprised of their own subset of individuals, firms, states, social norms, et cetera. So it's like a little bit nuanced. There's a sort of original institutional economics field, and there's a new one, and there's a lot going on here. But I'm going to use the term specifically to address this sort of scale thing where we have, you know, parts and holes, and in a sense, our agents are, you know, best understood through the perspective of behavioral economics, but that our institutions, which are, you know, groups of agents acting together, effectively becoming an agent in another system, um, it nests. And this is consistent with actually engineering paradigms where there's a sort of recursive um, part-whole relationship required to understand how, you know, relatively complex systems emerge from, you know, subsystems and in, in, in unintuitive ways sometimes. So I tend to address this topic using this framing micro meso macro that was um, published um, among other authors, uh, Jason Potts, who is a um, very involved in this sort of institutional economics research of blockchain and uh, of crypto. Um, he's at RMIT in Australia. And this particular diagram is actually from our crypto economics paper um, that I, I mentioned at the beginning. And we talk about the relationship between the system, the, so the say the, the ecosystem or the network and the behavior that we see emerging and the sort of measurement of the properties we ca care about, like, you know, these are things like wealth distributions and market caps and sort of total hash power um, on the Bitcoin network, et cetera. And, and they're, they're, they're characterizations of something that's inherently more complex, but at a high level, they're like macro measures. And we use those measures and we set goals and we think about what we want. And when I say we here, I actually mean policymakers, either designers of these systems who are setting up optimizations that are built into the protocols. They could also be people with governance authority. In the systems framing, it doesn't necessarily matter who the we is. The we is the is the uh, identity of the whole of the of the institution, and it can be you know specific you know, centralized actors, if the, if such actors exist, like they would in a firm, but they can also be, again, the optimization algorithms or objectives that we've codified in our algorithms when we designed these networks, or something in between where the algorithms help decide who gets to decide what under what circumstances. Um, and from there, those, those policies are implemented through rules and incentives, et cetera, and they affect the, the rights that 
um, agents have, what, what mechanisms or interaction patterns are opened up to them, and they in turn act through them, which results in sort of system, system level metrics that are a consequence of the individual level activities. And we can see that those activities are affected by not just each other, but by perception and possibly by things that are sort of outside the system from our, our framing perspective. So we always have to assume that there's sort of information that to be expressed or transformed into the system from outside. It's not a closed system. And so as we sort of go to unpack this, we, we talk about things in terms of complexity science, because in fact, this field does exist and has been you know, part of a, a long arc of, of systems research over many, many decades and has sort of its current form today is um, sort of championed by organizations like the Santa Fe Institute, NEXI, which is the New England Complex Systems Institute. And it's important to sort of keep track of what's being done in these areas to better understand complexity, especially in the case of uh, social and economic systems. And so we examine systems as a whole, which tends to include, you know, a, very simple things all the way up to extremely complex things. We're narrowing in on, on systems that have, are, are complex, which can include things like, um, you know, airplanes, but also social and economic systems, which we're sort of subsetting down to our crypto economic systems, which have a lot of like standard complex systems properties. They're dynamic, networked, adaptive, multi-scale, and they have uh, stochastic elements. And I, I'll sort of air quote the stochastic because one could argue that they're not actually they don't actually have randomized elements but rather that their models are modeled using stochastic elements because those are the best mathematical representations of the systems that are actually being realized um sort of i will only relatively briefly address the concept of, of networked because i think this community understands it quite well we have entities uh, these are real world identities people, firms, et cetera. They have accounts. Accounts are the um, addresses in various blockchain networks that um, sort of hold the state specific to them, for example, funds um, and nodes, which are actually you know, peers and peer-to-peer -peer networks. And in fact, you can be a member of many networks. So even one network is already a multi-scale graph, um, but we actually have a multi graph of multi-scale graphs in order to really understand the, the crypto uh, economic ontology that, that's emerging. So it's sort of important to get some, some intuition about how, um, how dynamical systems and games evolve on graphs, on networks. And I think there's a lot of advancement in that understanding. And in particular, I'm excited by the research being done by folks like Claudio Tassone and um, Andrea Bar Baroncelli, one's in the former's in, in Zurich and the latter is in, in London at uh, the Turing Institute. And these kinds of data science researches are, are looking at the data thrown off by these systems and trying to better understand these networks. Um, but there's also this sort of theoretical level of understanding in the network science community. Um, and I've done some work with uh, Victor Preciado at Penn to sort of really try to grok the, even the unobservable aspects of, of, of network dynamic processes. And we're actually seeing some of the complexities of the unobservable aspects of network processes with the COVID crisis right now. So kind of moving on from the complexity into systems engineering. Um, the field of engineering is, is something that I think uh, has some aspects that are not fully realized in the, the sort of software engineering best practices, at least uh, not as we find them in sort of product and start, startup product development. And, and that's because of, of its relationship to complexity, actually. So higher order engineered systems, um, you know, bridges, power grids, cars, airplanes, et cetera, they have this sort of property that they require multi-specialization, meaning you can't just have, there's not like any one expert. You need many people with different expertises, including people whose expertise is actually putting things together. And systems engineers are actually like, they're like uh, meta project ma uh, product managers. They have to be able to manage products that are composed of products that are potentially composed of products because you're putting together components into system into subsystems and subsystems into systems where at the end of the day the final thing is not actually complex to the user that the complexity management is i drive over the bridge 
I, I feel like it's safe. I'm not worried about it. I don't even have to think about it. I just do it. As a user, I'm like almost completely agnostic to the complexity under the hood. But that puts a really strong like ethical burden on the design and is a reason why there's regulation around engineering and around the the role of the professional engineers who's li who are licensed to make final approvals of designs because they actually have skin in the game. They bear responsibility for the final sign off that this is a safe thing. And it actually is a critical aspect of the engineering field that we put the sort of public good ahead of our um, fiduciary duty, which is something that's interesting actually, because I think in the, even in AI um, field, there really hasn't been a lot of maturation in the, in the engineering ethics until like very recently it's becoming a thing um, where we're like, oh, like these decisions, they affect people's well being, their lives. And um, as a result, we're kind of coming back around to the, the questions about how does one evaluate and decide whether something is appropriate for release onto the public when it will have effects on them? And so it's an interesting question in AI, but I think it's also a very important question in crypto. And one of the reasons why I'm a big proponent of the growing token engineering field is because it takes engineering as its sort of anchor reference point and looks at the places where we can Again, find patterns, find best practices. And then, you know, in engineering, regulation doesn't work quite the way that it works in finance. It's more about whether you did all of the things that you could have done to make sure that it would be as safe as it could be, given the best practices. So, you know, someone doesn't necessarily go to jail if a bridge falls down, but there's still a chance because if it's shown that they were negligent in their assessment of whether or not the bridge should go up or they, you know, missed critical um, sort of safety considerations and that that was in fact what caused the problem, then actually people's, pe you know, people are held responsible. But it's not as simple as a taxonomy of good bridge, bad bridge, because bridges are very contextual to the particular, you know, shores that they're, you know, that they're spanning. So we expect, you know, crypto systems to also be very contextual to the sort of communities and, and value propositions that they are um, supporting. Um, and sort of that kind of brings me to the sort of heart of what aspect of 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 the crypto uh, systems needs to have this like deep thought about ethics, and it's really about models. So it's very similar to AI. When you choose underlying abstractions and, and patterns that represent value and decision making, and what the interaction patterns are, um, these these models, they're performative. The way that you choose to measure value defines what value is and then affects people. And so we have to be very careful about how we make subjective choices of objective measures, bake them into the system, and furthermore, the capacity to sort of evolve them over time. And this also includes models of governance, models of, of sort of steering level decision making because ultimately those systems affect how power how power moves over time and whether or not the system remains sort of you know safe in the sort of uh, sense that all stakeholders continue to have a say over its path um, and and I think this is an area where the discussions around capture and various interests financial interests versus potentially operational interests um, sort of take control over a system's um, sort of steering and make it maybe more or less suitable for the other stakeholders. So these are inherently multi-stakeholder systems, so they're going to have tensions between representations. There's not going to be necessarily a, a right answer. And so, you know, how do we deal with that? So in, in a sense, though, we can start to unpack how to deal with this using tools like computational social science, where we, we look at the way that systems evolve over time, um, but not just based on their computational elements, but also based on their open sort of human inputs. So I talk about uh, this concept expression, meaning this the human actor is not optimizing for something other than expressing their own preferences. <laughs> they have some private utilities, private signals, private preferences, possibly changing over time. They are influenced by the way the system works. They are influenced by the state of the system, but not uniquely. So when they make their 
decisions, they're actually conferring information to the system rather than optimizing for it. In, in a sense, you could say they are optimizing for it, though, by providing that information because they are part of the system. And that's what's really challenging, right? How do we reason about the sort of uh, the interconnectedness of the algorithmic elements and the sort of human decision making elements? And as I mentioned before, I'm actually very enthusiastic about some of the um, some of the tools that uh, sort of much more mathematical fields like like category theory, like control theory, like optimization theory actually bring us, but not necessarily in their sort of first order, we just apply them directly, but more in our understanding about how these sort of structured processes affect the outcomes. And that kind of brings us back to our, our engineering ethics question. It's a bit like architecture in the digital space and cyberspace. We're designing the shape of space, but then people are going to you know walk around. You know, you don't need a giant hand to push someone down a hallway. It's a hallway. There's a good chance they'll walk down it and go through the door at the other end. Um, so with that, uh, another field that I mentioned, uh, operations research is actually, um, it's it's actually closely tied to decision making around, around profit, around sort of, again, this notion of a rational decision maker, which to be fair, is still important. We're not throwing it away. It's just, it's there more to understand the constraints of the system rather than the objectives. So in, in OR, you, you deal a lot with operational expenditures, you know, capital expenditures, return on investment, like you manage potentially very large scale combinations of lower level decision making systems. But ultimately, the job of such a system is to make sort of a consistent reproducible profit in, a, in return for presumably creating something of meaningful value to another party. And it employs both theoretical and empirical methods. It has elements of both social science and physical science. It's just that a lot of the sort of work that would be relevant to us is maybe not the stuff that you would read in a management journal, but it's something that you might read in the sort of um, some of the more formal segments of the INFORMS community, or in particular SIAM, which is the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. Um, I think the key here, though, is that as we increasingly digitalize and automate business processes, it's actually possible to further decentralize them while meeting what I call the sort of profitability constraint. This doesn't mean growth unbounded. It literally means there's a constraint that I have to make enough money to cover what I'm spending and enough margin to make it worthwhile. And then, yes, maybe I would like to make more and more and more and grow and grow and grow. But there's a difference between the desire on one party to make more profit and the constraint which says if you don't make at least this much, you won't be able to persistently fulfill this function. And so it actually helps with the translation towards a slightly more ecological um, framing where you can think about the financial constraints a bit like the sort of food, eating food constraints in, in, a, in an eco ecological system. If there's not enough food to cover your energy costs, you are going to die. And a business in an economic ecosystem, if there's not enough value flowing to it, it's going to fail to continue to fill the operation operational costs that it are required to be met for it to persist. And if that was a critical species in that business ecosystem, then it might die out and it could actually cause a cascade failure of the whole ecosystem because something that was important, something necessary became unprofitable. Imagine what would happen if suddenly the job of being a Bitcoin miner became so unprofitable for whatever reason that the miners just started to disappear. And eventually we didn't have a sort of cryptographic security claim that we were comfortable with or a, 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 an economic security claim relative to the, the cryptographic processes going on. You know, that might undermine that, that, that piece of infrastructure. Um, Hard to say because you know we haven't had a, a an experience with that on something that was as large scale as say Bitcoin, but we can sort of imagine it happening um, with some examples from smaller networks that have had issues. Um, so I'm going to talk for a moment about CAD CAD and how it fits. So we use CAD CAD in an operational operations research sort of paradigm. 
um, at least at block science, because we do some work that's not necessarily crypto related. Um, and But we can still think about this as a general pattern where we have formalized mathematical abstractions. These are representations of systems and processes. We can integrate them with real world data. We make projections into the future and we use those projections to form uh, design decisions or potentially governance decisions. And, and this is a, a sort of pattern of practice that I've used since well before getting involved in crypto. And in fact, you know, building it out for the crypto ecosystem has been like a long journey and we have a long way to go still because it's, uh, again, sort of natively from, from elsewhere. And so we're kind of bringing it in and making an effort to make it available for the kinds of systems that we have in crypto. And that comes back to the effort to build out sort of patterns and best practices because we need those patterns in order to sort of streamline the application of this procedure. Um, and sort of with that, I will talk about kind of where this concept comes from. Um, I, I associate it personally with the cyber physical systems literature. I recommend that everyone go to the tolme.berkeley.edu project slash CPS and play around with this diagram because if you click on things, it will describe to you the details of the bubble. But what I really want to point out about this diagram is that the uh, systems have humans in the loop, they're networked or distributive, they're adaptive and predictive. It sounds a lot like crypto systems, right? They have cybersecurity elements, the gray section of here. They have actual applications in a wide range of industries from healthcare to energy to transportation. It's, it's actually kind of crazy to see how closely this maps up maps to the kinds of things that we're doing. But I want to point out a really important aspect is that this middle thrust, this yellow and orange, is widely absent in the in the crypto community. And as compared to it being the sort of bedrock of the, the cyber physical systems community. And so with an uh, you know kind of effort here, we're trying to do things like CAD CAD, like token engineering, um, you know, and projects like the Common Stack and others are working on their patterns to try to bring this sort of, you know, diagram together to fill it in. And obviously it's an ongoing process, but I think it's actually important for people to recognize the, the similarities in order to pattern match and find the missing pieces and help fill them in as part of a broader maturation process. Because um, the cyber physical systems term was coined in the mid 2000s, but the sort of technological underpinnings of it were, were growing growing up and becoming put into practice before that. Um, some, some basic examples are sort of power grid infrastructure. Actually, our transportation systems are very much um, cyber physical systems. There's a, a thing that I think um, some people don't know that uh, many traffic lights, they have um, like reprogrammable um, uh, microcontrollers that can change the policies for the lights. So you could, and you can even in some cases do that dynamically. You can have them like essentially networked to try to time lights to get um, throughput to be managed based on sensors. There's like um, sort of magnetic sensors that can detect whether a car is stopped at a light. There's like all sorts of cool stuff. And I think the idea here is that this hybrid sort of infrastructure with automation, with sensors, with humans making decisions are not actually just from crypto. They, they exist in the world around us and we can like learn from each other if we can build better sort of translations and mappings where we understand where the similarities lie. Um, so I'm going to make a great, uh, like a toy example using a robotic arm that I think I find helps. And in that example, um, essentially there's a robotic arm and you can imagine having a joystick that controls it. And that, that, that arm has some important properties and that is it can only actually take certain configurations. So no matter what combination of inputs you put into the controller, the arm is only gonna move in the way as the arm moves. It, it can't bend into positions that violate its underlying structure, like the lengths of the lever arms, the directions, the angles curve. And you can think of a mechanism as being like a way of moving the arm. The arm has its own state space, which is sort of all of the points of all of the parts, but it also has a subspace, which means that there are places it can't be. Um, and what's interesting about this is that this underlying structure is upheld for all possible combinations of all inputs to all of the mechanisms for moving the arm. 
which means that if we enter a world now where we give everyone in the chat a controller to plus mess with the arm, it might flail around and do some weird stuff, but it won't violate its configuration space. So this is a sort of like, you know, shape or structural object. It's an abstract mathematical object related to the underlying model that was used to design the robot arm in the first place. But any properties that that arm physically has are actually going to be inviolable, inviolable under all sequences of actions over all agents. And this is the kind of... Um, uh, sort of protection that we need in order to make these systems safe for composition. Because when you compose things, you sort of lose good reasoning about why or what someone might do on the mechanisms. So we have to move away from necessarily thinking about what people will do towards what they can do. And a, a sort of aside, one of my friends from grad school, he's a product manager for a, a surgical robot company. And you know, one of the things that he, he pointed out that best practices for surgical robots actually ensure that the software doesn't have the ability to do certain things, that the physical robot is physically constrained against certain types of movements precisely because it needs to be unable to do those things under all possible inputs because it's part of the safety considerations of the robot. And there's a separation in the systems engineering between the software that sort of takes the inputs from the surgeon and you know, filters or modulates it to be more precise, but then there's even the physical structure of the robot providing a configuration space that limits the risk of harm. And this is the paradigm that I'm really pushing with my, my research on configuration spaces for, for crypto. And we've been using bonding curves as a reference case because they're actually very simple configuration spaces that we can use to start to define not just that primitive, but what primitives are. Um, and so I'm going to sort of speed over this. Chris Peruk presented some of it in an earlier talk. I think we'll continue to see variations of it. Um, we'll continue to learn. But effectively, the argument is that a bonding curve can serve as an estimator for uh, expressed price information by saying that the goal isn't just to have the bonding curve go up forever. That's not its point. The point is that over time, the heterogeneous estimates of individuals about the value of the token that it mints, and specifically that token isn't just a magical thing that you want because it's going to be worth money in the future. It has to have a, an actual conference of a right. It could be a right to a future revenue. It could be a right to participate in the governance process. It could be an arbitrary constellation of rights that are specific to the community that issued it. But then, in a sense, the bonding curve helps us value that right. So you're not buying it to speculate necessarily though one might, you are buying it because you want the rights it confers. And then in a sense, the bonding curve creates an estimator of the perceived value of that right. And it can move up and down over time. But ultimately, the augmented bonding curve design basically says, in order to benefit from um, this as a community, it need not go up, it just needs to move. And the nice thing about that assumption is that people's opinions being widely varying result in these sort of noisy market processes. And if you capture some of the friction from making transactions on these bonding curves and funnel it to the project being supported, you can, in fact, create sort of a continuous source of funding that is not tied to perpetual growth, as we sort of brought up in, in the previous, um, the end of the previous talk. So at that, I'm going to show a picture and sign off, I think. Uh, this is a video that Marcus from the Block Science team made with real data from the FDI Uniswap, the old one, now SI, but uh, it was made a few months ago. And it basically shows the configuration space of a Uniswap instance, which is closely related to a bonding curve in that the minted token is actually the pool token, and it represents a share in the liquidity pool itself. It's not um, necessarily a bonding curve in the sense that it has a curve, but it's a bonding curve in the sense that there's a linear, um, and in our papers we call them kappa, um, it has, has a linear uh, shape. And 
interestingly enough, um, it's like it has two different reserve assets because it has the swaps. And it, so it provides two composed mechanisms with a handful of underlying states. In that way, it serves as something like a robotic arm and one where we can actually start to infer something about the nature of the system from its state and from it, the change in that state over time. Um, what interests me the most about it is it does seem to serve as a, a really powerful connector in the sense that it, it provides on one axis a connection between two assets, so kind of like a wire linking an economic network. And it also provides a sort of um, a, a buffering role in the sense that people can put capital into the liquidity pool when a in, Uniswap instance is higher liquidity, it essentially has more inertia. It takes more activity or a larger transaction to move the price. And so you can think of it in physical systems terms if you're kind of able to reason about uh, spring mass systems or sort of other, um, you know, ordinary differential equations and start to get a sense of actually how, you know, in a circuit system, for example, the the resistor, capacitor, inductor systems are capable of designing large classes of filters by combining certain primitives. We can think about these emerging sort of token um, operators, these differential operators, as, as the kinds of primitives that we use to construct systems. But I think the real challenge is that at least from my experience, this system's design, this composition of mechanisms bears a lot more similarity to signal processing, control, online machine learning, and other fields that deal with real-time sort of event and, and event-driven systems. Um, again, that's a little bit more CPS with event-driven, but like the, the, the knowledge and the capability for managing these dynamic systems is, um, uh, is, is, is out there and that we need to like work to not only find it, learn it, you know, re reframe it and make it more accessible to our, our communities in, in crypto economics. So um, that will, I'll, I will end with this sort of comment then that this economy as an evolving shape of cyberspace and that we are designing it and we are analyzing it and we are learning from it. And the exciting thing about this is that we realize that we're doing this and we're doing it actively, but it's also really important to recognize the hazards and the dangers because you know, creating new institutional patterns does not necessarily always work out well. Um, and sometimes they degrade and reform and we wanna be thinking um, carefully about what we're doing and how our changes to our capabilities affect the way that we build things, the way we interact with each other, et cetera. So, um, I'm going to end on that and go to questions. I ran over. I always run over. I'm sorry. That's all right. We have 15 minutes still until the next speaker. Thank you very much, Michael, for, for the amazing talk. Uh, I must say, I don't know if you've been following the program uh, uh, today and, and yesterday, but actually almost, I don't know, every second or every third speaker has talked about CatCat -Cat and everyone um, uh, is using it. And I think it must be very rewarding for, for you to hear that people are, I mean, you probably already know who's using it, but it must be rewarding that uh, every other speaker is actually working on CatCat. -Cat. So thank you very much. Thank you also for taking the time. Um, and we can go to the Q&A session now. Would anyone like to raise a hand here in the interactive space? Yeah, great. Oh, I mean, I feel bad. I, I get to talk to Z all the time. So if anyone has any questions, like, go ahead. I'll try to keep it short. Um, but, yeah, hi. Uh, oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> hi. I'd like to raise a question. Um, Michael, you, you have shown us a, a huge list of uh, disciplines to draw knowledge and methods from. And also, we heard talks um, yesterday and today on, okay, um, this is really a broad space, a multidisciplinary space, and there is huge, well, a huge range of knowledge that what we can draw from. But on the other hand, this also sometimes it makes me think it must feel totally overwhelming. So like without having this and that and this broad range of backgrounds, you can't do anything. And maybe this is also a question to Griff. I mean, uh, at some point, you decided to start Common Stack. Um, how to get a handle on this complexity, right? And not giving up uh, because I mean, it's really we also oh. had it in the 
match, right? So. I, let me just say, on my side, I get Z, so I don't have to worry about it. Just, <laughs> Um, actually, so I think the most important answer to that question is the thing I said about multi-specialization. So I am admittedly, like I've been doing sort of automation and decision making and social and economic systems for, oh God, like almost 20 years, I guess. If you count the work that I was doing as an undergraduate, I did some, some, some consulting, I did some uh, agent-based modeling, I did some evolutionary modeling, and my undergraduate thesis even was on um, sort of policy for tech adoption. And I sort of transitioned into doing more sort of robotics and multi-agent systems for second bachelor's, master's, PhD. Um, and so like really long arc with a lot of mentors and a lot of fields, co-authors, et cetera. And so, you know, I've had this sort of time to integrate up all this stuff. But one of the most important learnings was that any particular expert was actually an expert in a subset. So when I lay all this stuff out there, it's not actually meant to say, go learn everything. But like, it actually kind of means these are the topics we need to cover collectively and and probably more that, that even I'm not touching, right? And so what's important is that people have this sort of breadth, depth, T. You need to understand what matters. That's breadth. That doesn't mean become an expert in everything. And it does mean potentially gain expertise in a subset of things that are interesting to you or that like really meet your skills or both. And that when we work together, we can create a sort of cover that handles like all of the necessary expertises for a particular project at a particular time and we avoid for example missing things that we probably should have known we needed because we lacked breadth so that depth breadth mixing actually goes back to systems engineering and how we do things like like I worked on building some robots, right? I wrote navigation systems. I was a high level decision and control engineer, whereas someone else was responsible for the, the mechanical system. Someone was responsible for the power system. Actually, I had a teammate who worked closely with me who actually de put the algorithms that I was designing in basically mathematics and MATLAB simulations, et cetera, into the actual uh, onboard, like basically I think he was writing Oh, it's a long time ago now, but he was writing C code, right? And he was compiling it onto the the relatively um, like sort of low um, uh, uh, the low level. I'm sort of trying to figure out how to bring this up without de degrading into technical jargon. Whatever. Point is. Um, we had a sort of onboard or processor. It was actually designed to be relatively low consumer of power. So the computations had to be very sparse essentially. So we went from the design of the algorithms and properties we wanted down to figuring out how to get them implemented in a way that wouldn't consume too much power because it was an autonomous robot that did like ran grids on ice in Antarctica. So the, the thing needed to actually not burn power because that would waste its lifetime and it needed to have the ability to charge up, it charged up and then it would go out. And if you made algorithms that were too computationally intense, you would actually um, sort of shorten its lifespan. But at the same time, it needed to be able to maintain certain tolerances on its grids because otherwise it didn't serve its function for, for mapping the ice flows. It carried a ground penetrating radar. But the point of this is that that team was six people and even then it had sort of advisors and other experts and each of the people on the team had a different specialization. So we shared the expertise and the breadth around robotics, but then we had sub expertises. And I see that as being absolutely necessary in token engineering and crypto economics. And that's why you see mixed teams and why you shouldn't be worried about not being an expert in all the things.